All right, guys. So uh, Dr. Boros is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at Stony Brook University. And uh, if we were in person, she would be able to give you a tour. She's going to try to do a virtual tour of her lab uh, later in the course. And she's going to have some of her students speak about their own research. And she's here to tell you some more about the more fun chemistry stuff. Now that uh, we've done all the solid state physics, she's going to tell you how we can use some of those detectors and the kinds of techniques you would use uh, chemically to be able to work on, say, radiopharmaceutical research, right? So, and uh, she can give you some more information. I'm going to pass it off to her. Thanks so much, Chris. First of all, uh, hello, everybody. I wish I could see you in person, but uh, this year just will have to do. So I have been tasked with telling you guys a little bit about radiochemical techniques. So this is loosely based on chapter 19 of the textbook, but I'm gonna say very loosely because I have incorporated some uh, examples, some real life examples from radio metals targetry and purification that you're not going to find in a textbook, but I'm also going to talk a little bit more about more modern techniques, I think what's covered in the textbook is a little bit older. Um, and also what I'll talk about is probably a little bit more on the chemistry focused side and more from the perspective of a, a radio chemist who makes radio pharmaceuticals like myself and maybe less a targetry person. But of course, both are very important to actually bring radioactive isotopes from the hot target stage to something that is injectable into humans. So I am going to start and warm you guys up with a little bit of math. I promise that we're not gonna do a whole bunch of math muscle stretching after this, but I wanna just go back and discuss a little bit about the, um, how we can connect activity and actual quantity of isotopes. So I believe that you guys are already well acquainted with these type of units. You know about Curies or Becquerels. If at any point in time anything is unclear, please feel free to raise your hand or interrupt me or ask questions. I'm going to ask you guys questions too. You can't escape that. So that will happen too. But this should be fairly fam familiar to you. If you are a radiochemist in the United States, you still tend to prefer Curies, but the SI unit is Becquerels. So if you're trained in Europe, you will be trained in Becquerels. I myself was trained in Switzerland first, so I'm more familiar with Becquerels as well, but now I use Curies since I uh, operate out of Stony Brook, um, New York State. So we know the relationship between Curies and Becquerels when Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the power of 10 decays or disintegrations per second. So one Becquerel is one decay per second. For this exercise, we're gonna use Curies or more commonly, one Curie is a lot of activity if you are a, a radio chemist who makes radio pharmaceuticals, just to give you sort of a little bit of guidance how much is injected in a human for imaging and diagnostic purposes, we would say somewhere between a millicury to maybe three or four millicuries. That's more typical. If you give somebody a curie of activity, that is a lot of radioactivity and you're probably going to get some not so nice effects. So just to give you some guidance, chemistry in my lab is done also on the millicury level. So we do chemistry with activity ranging from 0 0.05 millicuri all the way up to about 20 millicuri at most. So when we talk about activity and then we think about what the actual quantity of that radioactive isotope is, we really need to think about this correlation here or this um, equation here that describes activity and the relationship of the number of radioactive nuclei. This is really important because we need to remember that some isotopes that have, for instance, short half-lives decay with more disintegrations per second than others do. 
that have longer half-lives. So even though we may have the same amount of disintegrations per second, we really do not have present the same number of radioactive nuclei. So this equation that I have here on the bottom describes this relationship between the activity and the number of radioactive nuclei. And we have as a constant the decay constant that relates the two. So the decay constant is not usually something that you can find more easily when you look at description of radioactive isotopes. Typically what you will find is of course the half-life. So the half-life has a, a relationship that we can figure out with the decay constant lambda as follows. And this should be familiar to you. I believe you guys have done some, some half-life calculations and some decay constant calculations. So you can relate the half-life to your decay constant. Now, for instance, for fluorine 18, uh, we have a half-life of about 109 minutes. So if we would calculate lambda, this is what we get for the lambda factor. So I use fluorine 18 as an example because it's really important for radiopharmacies. Another isotope that is becoming increasingly important is zirconium 89 that has a really nice long half-life. So what I would like you guys to do as your one and only math gymnastics exercise, and I'm giving you quite a bit here on the bottom, I'm giving you already the decay constants, is to calculate how much in number of atoms and then also in moles, one millicurie of fluorine 18 and one millicurie of zirconium 89 corresponds to. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes just to run through this and then raise your hand when you have finished your calculation and then we'll talk about the results that we're getting. Make sure to raise your virtual hand once you've finished so I get an idea for how much longer we need.
Okay, so while we're waiting for about the two third of the class, some, some observations that are being made from these numbers that maybe the people can share that have already solved at least A and B. Just go ahead and talk. So for A, B, there are 3.5 times 10 to the 11th atoms and 5.81 times 10 to the negative 13th moles. Correct. So if you contrast that with the result that you're getting from, for the zirconium isotope, how do the numbers compare? It's the same amount of activity but with respect to the number of atoms, what do you see? I have that the number of moles um, between them are like, or they differ by two orders of magnitude. Exactly, right? So that's really nice demonstration of how different these quantities are when we have different decay constants and different half-lives. So not only are these very different numbers, but if we even just look at them in terms of what most of us are used to working with, so I believe most of you are uh, chemistry majors or at least have probably done some chemistry coursework and maybe also some uh, chemistry labs, what are some of the, the ballpark quantities you work with in a chemistry lab, roughly in moles? Maybe like half a mole or a mole yes. maybe? Yes, maybe even, you know, if you have a dilute solution, it may be a millimolar solution, right? So there is a massive difference of macrochemistry or how we call it usually cold chemistry and the hot chemistry that we carry out. So there is a big contrast here. So I'm gonna resolve the numbers for you guys. I'll uh, write them down. Let's see if I can use the pen. Okay, so. How many moles of fluorine 18 does one millicurie of F18 correspond to? So that was 5.8 roughly times 10 to the negative 13 mole. And for zirconium 89, somebody want to offer their answer? And I can check if I got the same thing. I got 2.5 times 10 to the negative fifth mole. 11? Is that what you said? 10 to? No, 10 I said 5. Sorry. 2.5 times 10 to the negative 11? Yes. That's what I got. OK. So I got 2.48, .4, but 2.5 rounded works for me too. So it's a two order of magnitude difference, as you can see. So again, this is because the half-life of zirconium-89 is longer. So we get less disintegrations per second. So in order to actually produce the same number of disintegrations per second, you need a much greater number of zirconium-89 atoms to be present so they can actually decay and produce the same amount of disintegrations. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes? Okay, great. I, I would usually look into the room and see if, if heads are nodding, but I don't have that option right now. Um, so I, I rely on your verbal cues. So just, just shout away whenever possible. Um, and so, what about decay? So now we can look at what happens to 
how rapidly the activity decays away with the different half-lives. So C and D, any answers here? For C, I got um, 2.871 times 10 to the 7 becquerels. Um, in Curie? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that number <laughs> times, wait, divided by three times 10 to the 7. Not point ten, rather. So I'm sure you're right, but I can't back calculate it right now. But you should get about 0.78 millicurie. But of course, you're more right than I am because I calculated in curie, which is not technically the SI unit. So I'll give it to you guys in curie. But when I upload uh, or send off the slides for upload, I'll put also the numbers in Becquerel for you guys. What about zirconium? I got 0.99 MCA. So if we now would convert the, the amount of activity to moles of these individual isotopes, what we would get for the F18 would be 4.5 times 10 to the negative 13. Mole. And for the zirconium, we get 2.47 times 10 to the negative 11 moles. So you can see that even within 40 minutes, we lose about a quarter of the number of fluorine 18 atoms. So this poses a lot of challenges to chemistry and separation chemistry and radiochemistry as we need to carry it out in order to actually either isolate or make these isotopes useful. Is the math clear? Are the calculations clear on here? Please let me know if you have any questions. Oh yeah. Good. Okay. So now that we know what kind of different sort of microscopic world we operate in when we do radiochemistry. What are some of the challenges? What do you guys think of tracer chemistry or trace radiochemistry at this pico scale? Having sensitive enough detectors, maybe? Absolutely. Characterization is difficult, right? We're going to talk about or contrast characterization techniques for macrochemistry versus radiochemistry on the next couple of slides as well. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. What else? Um, when you work with that chlorine, it has a short half-life, so you have to work pretty quickly if you want to maintain the activity that you started with. Correct. So um, techniques have to be quick to implement, right? Other thoughts? PPE, I mean, I guess that's not so much trace as it is radiochemistry, but hazardous. Absolutely. So we can't just freely scale up our reactions, right? One way of making chemistry go easier for us in cold chemistry is, oh, I'll just go scale up the reaction, I get more product. We don't really have that option, either because we may be limited by the amount of isotope that we have access to in the first place, or because of course it can be hazardous. We can't just take kilograms of plutonium and you know do an acid desolution and then a nice extraction by hand, right? Because that's a PPE issue, it's a safety issue. Yes, what else?
These were all really good points. Just maybe creating the sample to begin with? So producing sufficient amounts to even be able to do chemistry on it. Sure, that is definitely another challenge. So just to try to help you along, for instance, when you think about common techniques that you've used in an orgo lab to purify a sample, what have you used? What kind of technique have you used? Like precipitation or something like that? Precipitation, exactly. So precipitation, what does that relate to in terms of an equation that you can think of? What do you need for a precipitation to occur? What was that? Sorry. I said you need. I mean, you, you can use your KSP values and know what's if something's going to precipitate. KSP values. So the KSP values are dependent on concentration, correct? So when you work at a pico scale, suddenly you're going to be below the KSP. This is a huge challenge because now precipitating out a radioactive sample is going to be really difficult. So it's not just something that applies to thermodynamic equations that are concentration dependent, but of course, kinetic equations are also concentration dependent. So we really need to think about all of these aspects together when we develop different types of methods to purify and also characterize radioactive samples. So we already touched on this and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Conventional analytical methods have limited sensitivity. The kinetics and the thermodynamics are concentration dependent of chemical reactions. That includes precipitation reactions, conversions between different oxidation states and species. They depend on kinetics and thermodynamics. Everything is concentration dependent. This we need to take into consideration as we may be carrying out a reaction as practice on a macro level with milli or micromolar amounts of compound, and then we switch to the pico mole world that is very different. Of course, then there's another issue. This is something that you may encounter, if you would do a lab, you, would, you might encounter this. This is something that I had to learn the hard way too, and my students as well. It turns out that a lot of tools and vessels, for instance, glass has a propensity to absorb some amount of ionic species. Now, when you work on a macro scale, you're absorbing a little bit on the glass surface. It's not a big deal. But of course, when you're working on a pico scale and you get absorption of a cation into the silica, that's a massive problem because you're going to lose a lot of your sample. So one way of actually avoiding this is to work with uh, very acidic samples to sort of load up the proton concentration in the sample and essentially coat out these uh, cation binding pockets that the glass has so that we can diminish binding of the radioactive cations. This is something we already touched upon with our little math exercise. Radiochemical samples are dynamic. We have a constant decay. We need to be quick on our feet. So Purification and characterization needs to be done quickly. Radioactive decay can produce chemical elements with different properties, but they live in the same chemical environment. So when you think about actinide decay, some of the actinides have oxidation states or can exist in oxidation states in, for instance, aqueous solution that other actinides don't exist in because of electrochemical properties. This is something we need to think about. And but this is actually something that we can take advantage of when we do purifications. Another thing that we tend to underestimate is that radioactive decay also produces energy. So that can lead to degradation or a change of the immediate chemical environment of the isotope. So you need to think about the degradation of the the compound that you intend to incorporate your isotope into, or even the material that you're using 
to purify, for instance, biomembranes, biological samples. If you're using a protein to selectively bind a radioactive isotope over another, it may actually start degrading because of the decay properties of the specific isotope. So these are things that we really need to think about when we work with radioactive samples. So, yeah. Uh, could I add one thing? And it's cost. In our yeah. company, cost covers several of the categories that you talked about. When you're working with radiochemical reactions and things bind to glass, uh, what we use is we scale everything down into uh, cartridges. So rather than pour a column where you have some sort of chromatography occurring uh, and you collect it, it's pushed through a really, really, really small column. That way you can have a very small amount of products come, going in, reactants coming out, you reduce the exposure of personnel, and uh, that whole thing saves you time. And when in a company, when you save time, you save money. That cartridge saves you a lot of effort and time, which you then bill to someone else. But the bottom line is, is that uh, several of those things uh, all come together with cost. Yeah. So if we now go back and start to contrast again, radiochemistry with our macro or cold chemistry, if you think again, I, I always try to get you guys to think about orgo lab because you learn a lot of purification techniques fairly early in organic lab. If this brings up bad memories, I sincerely apologize. Um, but if you think about the techniques that you learned for quantifying or assessing the purity or the speciation for a cold compound, what comes to mind? What kind of analytical tools? Like thin layer chromatography or any kind of chromatography method? TLC, so that's, that's some characterization. It's also a uh, separation method, yes. Other? NMR. NMR. And mass spec. Mass spec. Melting points. Melting points, yes. So what are some of the quantities you need for an NMR or a mass spec or a melting point determination? Milligrams for NMR. Milligrams, correct. So how many moles you think you need? Maybe a millimole, right? or like a micromole of like a, a small molecule, right? I also had um, IR, I tried to think back at techniques that I had used to in, in undergraduate labs. Maybe some of you have, have run an IR before, it can be very good to diagnose specific stretching frequency, frequencies like carbonyl stretches and things like that. GCMS, so mass spectrometry. How much compound do you need for mass spectrometry? I always use micro, I mean microliters. Sure, so like microgram quantities. Are we, are we getting into the range of radiochemical characterization techniques or something that would be appropriate to characterize a radioactive isotope? No. No, so NMR is not gonna work. Mass spec is not gonna work, the conventional mass spec techniques. Melting points, I fondly thought back at my melting point determinations, how much compound you guys need for melting points. Millimoles. Yes, again, a lot of material, probably not gonna be feasible, right? I have some other techniques here, do you guys recognize them? The, the one in the center on the bottom? The HPLC. HPLC. HPLC, yes. So what's the main readout on the HPLC typically? It can be absorbance. Absorbance, exactly. So what are some of the concentration ranges that could be appropriate to detect absorbance? 
Um, it can be micro to regular molarity. Yeah, that's a good guess. I would say depending on the compound, you could go even lower. So this may be a slightly more sensitive technique. Are we getting into the range of radiochemistry? Probably not quite. UV vis is the one on the bottom left, if you recognize that. Similar to HPLC, that may also not be an appropriate technique for us to try to characterize our radiochemical compounds. So the takeaway message here is that we're gonna have to get pretty creative when we want to understand how much isotope we have present, what the purity of our sample is, and what the speciation of our sp sample is. And these are very important aspects when we actually carry out radiochemical reactions. So for radiochemistry, I'm glad that I uh, came in a little bit early and saw some of Chris's presentation because I actually know that some of the radiochemical techniques of how to identify isotope purity you have actually already encountered. Is there anything that comes to mind that you can use to assess the purity of your radiochemical sample? Gamma spectroscopy or alpha spectroscopy. Exactly. So every isotope as it decays has a very unique fingerprint essentially of emissions. And that can allow us to identify what, how pure our sample is. Um, this is an instrument that you might have seen before. Have you guys talked about how people usually quantify activity? This is a simple dose calibrator that we use. So this tells you how much activity you have present, but it might not tell you how pure it is. So here is your isotopic purity, which is the gamma spec. I have here a little picture of the gamma spectrum of zirconium-89. You can see the 511 keV gamma that comes from the positron. And there's actually also what we call a hard gamma that is at 909 keV. So this is a very nice pure gamma spectrum of zirconium-89. Okay, so now we know how much we have. We know how pure it is with respect to isotopic purity. So how do we figure out what chemical form it is in? With the detector? With a detector, yes, a special kind of detector. This is my favorite instrument, actually. And when we give you the virtual lab tour, you'll get to see it as well, virtually. So we can characterize the species by actually having special types of TLC and HPLC instrumentation. So we touched upon the fact that UV isn't a good way of detecting radiochemical species. And you probably won't see the UV absorbance of a spot of a a UV absorbing radiochemical compound because of the concentration issue. But you can take a detector and you can hook it up to an HPLC or a TLC. And that's what you see on the bottom here. So the bottom left is what we call a radio TLC instrument. So you can see here is your TLC plate. And typically the way this, this measurement works is that you have this detector that detects the disintegrations and it will move slowly across the plate and it will generate a trace for you that tells you that on this axis of movement, there are certain amounts of activity on the plate. So you would get a readout that looks something like this. So the TLC plate, if you would look at the UV active species would look something like this. Okay, so this is what we call a radio TLC. Something I like a lot about this technique is when you're in Orgo Lab, you've probably been told many times that TLCs are not quantitative because you can't actually tell from the different UV absorbances of the spots how much you have there, but this is quantitative because you're measuring amount of activity on the plate. Similarly, but the HPLC that you see here, even though we may have UV detection, now you can see that there is a detector 
that is attached to the HPLC. So when it comes out of the chromatography column, your mobile phase, it will feed into your gamma detector. And the gamma detector will detect whenever a radioactive sample is moving through the tubing. So that will produce HPLC traces that look very much like UV traces. So your conventional HPLC trace may look something like this. Your radio HPLC trace may look exactly the same. So this allows us to actually directly identify what kind of species we have present. So in order to take the data that we get from these radio TLC and radio HPLC machines, what do we need to know before we even set out to do the experiment? Well, you would need to know like the expected energy levels for the gamma in order to identify like what um, radioisotope it belongs to. Yes, here definitely you need to know what to expect. So you can simulate this, right, if you make a new isotope based on the nuclear energy levels, correct? For the TLC and the HPLC techniques, you need to have also, again, some expectations, right? It's like when you go to the grocery store, you go in with a shopping list. You don't, don't just go in because you just, well, I mean, I would just end up buying ice cream and that's, that's not the point of going, going grocery shopping, right? So similarly, when you run TLC or HPLC, what you actually want to do before you set out to do the experiment is carry out what we call the cold characterization. So you actually make the non-radioactive version of your compound in the right speciation and use your, all your macroscopic tools to characterize that species. And then you produce a trace for instance, with UV on the HPLC, that you can then directly compare and overlay with your HPLC trace that you get on the hot side and the hot side of the chemistry things. Okay. Does this make sense? Yes. I have a question though. Yeah. So whenever we're doing TLC with nuclides or radionuclides, what are we, I suppose, separating or carrying them along the TLC plate by because in normal TLC it's polarity or ion or charge. So it is the same. The separation techniques that you can use on a macroscopic scale work on a microscopic scale as well. We're about to talk about that in a second as well. But you can run a TLC on 10 to the negative 13 moles of compound just as well as you can on 10 to the negative 5 mole of compound. And you can separate by polarity, you can separate by charge. All these techniques are fair game. Does okay, this answer your you. question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions to this part? Okay, so now we come to separation. So we've already talked a little bit about the different separation techniques when we think about cold chemistry. So on a macro scale, chromatography, right? So these are some of the tools that you may or may not think back to fondly. So we have our favorite liquid-liquid extraction here on the left. Um, SEP funnels that you definitely need to vent or the cork comes off. Those are my memories that I have from uh, how to learn to separate from liquid liquid. Um, we have precipitation, crystallization, which is sort of a spin on precipitation, right? So here we just do it in an ordered fashion. And then chromatography. So we have different types of chromatographies that we can carry out. Polar, apolar chromatography. So, for instance, on silica, that would be the apolar chromatography. So, um, apolar things move through quicker than polar things versus C18, um, long polymer chains that are charged that we typically use in preparative chromatography. Those would be polar chromatography. So, they're uh, really polar things would elute first versus apolar things will be retained more strongly. Ion exchange chromatography is really, really crucial uh, if you're an inorganic chemist 
because you can separate by charge. And size exclusion chromatography is very essential if you are going to separate things by size, especially biological samples, proteins versus small molecules. Any other techniques that come to mind? Anybody that I may have forgotten? Uh, affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography, so like a his tag type thing. Yeah, yeah, that definitely goes into here. Um, all the other techniques, is everybody familiar with these? I hope. Yep. More or less? Okay, great. So now if we go to radiochemistry, what are our options? Well, it turns out that they're the same. So separation techniques are gonna prevail even if we work at a micro scale or at a pico scale. The challenge is that now our samples are not pretty and colorful, so we won't be able to see them because they're so dilute. And we really need to be very aware where our sample is, how much sample we have loaded, and we essentially have to do good accounting for instance, when we do chromatography on a radioactive sample, we need to know how much radioactivity we have loaded on our column and how much is coming off in which fraction so that we can make sure that we collect the correct amount of activity and the correct fraction appropriately. So here is an example for precipitation-based separation. So this is something that you can still do. But again, you have to use a couple tricks. I have already mentioned that precipitation, even though it's a really nice way of separating in organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry compounds, we run into the problem of the KSP or being below the KSP when we have radioactive samples. So what can be done and what has been done actually extensively when people first worked on the separation of radioactive lanthanides and also the actinides, is that we add a carrier, so the non-radioactive isotope partner to our radioactive isotope to essentially increase the quantity and get above the threshold of our KSP. So there we go. So we do what we call a co-precipitation with the non-radioactive nuclide. So we call this a carrier. So carrier is specific for when we have the same isotope, uh, the same element as a partner to the isotope that we're precipitating. Because within an element, the isotopes have identical chemical behavior. Now, if we use an element that is different, but has similar chemical behavior and allows us to do co-precipitations, we call it a scavenger. And then once we've scavenged, we can use techniques that separate the similar element from a radioactive isotope based on the different properties that we have present. So the co-precipitation with a carrier is a really useful technique to just isolate a specific isotope we're interested in and quantify it versus when we actually want to further use the isotope, we might want to use a scavenger instead. Okay. Any questions to co-precipitation? No questions. Okay. So another very frequently used technique. And again, what you're going to see is I have somewhat of a bias to metals. So I'm going to talk a lot about metals for the rest of the slides that I'm going to show you uh, because I'm an inorganic chemist by training and my lab mostly works with radioactive metals. What is also really convenient to use are ion exchange chromatographies. This is especially important if you're trying to isolate um, or separate elements that have very similar chemical behavior. So an example for this is the lanthanide series. The lanthanides differ not by a whole lot. Do you guys ever talk about lanthanides in any of your courses? Not really. Not, not really. really. 
We talked about how they have like a special case for like their F orbitals and all of that. I mm-hmm. forget like the the um contraction phenomenon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that's correct. So you have heard of lanthanides, first of all, that's awesome. And you know a really important fact about them. That's great. So because of the the 4F orbital that's contracted and that actually hides under other orbitals, it um, causes this really close chemical similarity of the lanthanides to one another. So it's actually really difficult to isolate different lanthanides from one another. And what you can see here on the bottom is a elution chromatogram. So this is on the left-hand side, these are radioactive lanthanides and the y-axis here that I have so unconveniently cut off is activity. And this is elution volume. So this is ball, I'll just write it on here. And this is activity. So in any case, any normal case, it's very difficult to separate the lanthanide series from one another. But by using what we call ion exchange chromatography, we can actually use very, very slight differences that are mostly based on the different sizes of the lanthanides as an advantage for ourselves to actually separate them out. So the way that this is done for the sample that you're seeing here, where you get quite good separation, especially if you compare to really small lutetium and then sort of a larger terbium, gadolinium, europium, I would call those the intermediate to large lanthanides, you see that you get really nice separation. That is because this separation is done with what we call a cation exchange resin. And you can see the resin here on the bottom left. So this is a sulfate resin. So this is a polymer that has these sulfate groups that are appended to this polymer. And now these different cationic lanthanides that are all present in the three plus state are going to bind to this resin. And because of their different sizes, the property or the thermodynamics of this binding is slightly different. Now, when you introduce a ligand, sort of a weak bidentate ligand that you can see here, this is the alpha hydroxy isobutyric acid, into the sample, you're going to see binding of this, a binding pre- preference of this bidentate ligand to the lanthanides over the resin binding. So this is the preferred ligand over the resin that's sort of the less preferred ligand. So as soon as this binding occurs, we start to see an elution that depending on the size of the lanthanide will occur at different volumes of introducing an, a mobile phase that contains this bidentate ligand. Okay, so this is ion exchange chromatography. And this works nicely on a macro scale and it works just as well on a pico scale for radiochemical purifications. Any questions to this? No questions? Okay, so here, is, here are some definitions that are important um, going forward when you're thinking about radiochemical samples or chemical samples. So how do we define purity and yield of different separations or purifications? So when we talk about the chemical purity of a sample, we take the ratio of the moles of the desired product over the moles of all sample components. That's our chemical purity. The radioactive purity, or sometimes also called radioisotopic purity, tells us the activity of the desired isotope over the activity of all sample isotopes. Now, when you carry out, and often this is done sequentially, purification steps to isolate one isotope from an isotope mixture, what you wanna determine is a decontamination factor. So that will actually be the ratio of the radioactive purity after purification divided by the radioactive purity prior to purification. So this gives you an idea for how efficient your purification actually is. And now the radiochemical purity, in contrast to the radioactive purity, is the activity of your desired radiochemical product divided by the activity of all radiochemical sample components. So the radiochemical purity 
all of these, all of these um, uh, values are of course important when you try to make a, a very clean radiochemical sample. But when you make radiopharmaceuticals, for instance, of course, you have to start with a very high radioactive purity. You can't have a mixture of isotopes in there. You can't have fluorine 18 and then some very long lived isotope in there that just gets mixed in and then ends up being injected into a person. But of course, as a second step, once you incorporate this isotope into, for instance, an imaging agent, you want a very high radiochemical purity because you want to really only introduce one type of chemical species into the patient or the, the mouse or whatever study you're carrying out. Okay. So these are some of the definitions that we need to keep in mind. So I'm going to get into examples after this slide, but if you're interested in looking at different sort of slightly antiquated radiochemical separation of almost all elements, um, you can look at this link here. Again, you'll be able to get this link of the slide deck that I'll disseminate, but um, it's something that um, a Lionel Base group has put together. So this is specifically for radiochemical samples. So any questions up to here? How are we doing with Zoom fatigue? I realize I'm, I'm probably gonna go over by a little bit. How often do you guys usually take breaks every hour? Yeah, about every hour. Every hour? Okay, so I still have a number of slides where I'm just gonna show you, I'm going to show you examples um, for the different types of purifications for radioactive isotopes that are used for uh, imaging applications. So I'll give you guys a quick five minute break and then we'll get through the rest of the slides. Does that sound good? Okay, great. All right. So I'll see you guys back here at 2.05. I really liked how you're contrasting the radiochemical scale, the pico scale with the macro scale. It's the bane of our existence. Was that, was that your idea or was that in the, um, the Loveland text or was that just how you're trying to connect and get them in? No, that's just my, my spin on things. It's a good way to connect to what they might be more familiar with. I mean, it's where we all start, right? Like, I mean, I didn't, I had no clue how anything worked, even though I actually started doing radiochemistry in my sophomore year. So that was still super early, but all I had was Gen Chem Lab and first Orgo Lab as a basis. So it's easy to connect things, um, new knowledge to old knowledge, right? In this, in this fashion. Um, a liquid target here that is usually used for oxygen 18 enriched water. So the water sits somewhere here. The beam hits it where you can see the little red circle. Some gas is generated. Of course, the sample gets quite hot. And then as soon as the radiation is finished, the target is emptied through the bottom and then the separation begins. So what we start with is of course a mixture of the target material here. It's going to be oxygen and 18 enriched water. And it will contain, again, sub picomole to picomole amounts, as we know now, people make usually curie amounts of fluorine 18 when they first make it on a cyclotron these days. So we probably have almost a nanomole. So that still is not a whole lot if you think about it but we may have almost an animal of fluorine 18 that starts to decay very rapidly. So the first thing that needs to be done is an, a very efficient separation of this oxygen 18 that's present where the, uh, the fluorine 18 is dissolved in. So this is done using an ion exchange chromatography. We can take advantage of the single negative charge 
of the fluorine 18 versus the lack of inherent charge of the water molecule to carry out the separation. Subsequently, we have to elude off the ion exchange chromatography column by giving the fluorine 18 a cation to bind with. So that's what you see here on the bottom. This is potassium, for instance. And in order to be able to do chemistry with fluorine 18, we then need to introduce uh, this crown ether structure here that essentially separates the potassium from the fluorine 18 so that we can then subsequently actually do some nice chemistry. And for instance, here fluorinate this glucose precursor. So this is the now commonly used FDG synthesis. So this is a protected sugar. You see the acetylation here also on these alcohols. That's important to make sure that they don't isomerize. So you carry out a classic SN2 reaction. Again, a throwback for you for orgo. Again, I'm sorry about that. I'll promise I'll talk more about inorganic chemistry soon. In a fairly rapid conversion, we get the fluorination here. We deprotect and we generate our fluorine 18 labeled FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is very useful to image, for instance, cancer patients. So this is how you would move through. And this is done over the course within about two hours. So it's a very efficient synthesis that includes irradiation. So you have to irradiate your sample for a while in order to actually build up the fluorine 18. In your sample, you have to separate it, then you have to do chemistry on it. So this is the process. Any questions to this? No questions. Let's move on to metals, more fun with metals. So my lab's really interested in metals. The reason why metals are, radio metals are cool is because we can make a huge palette of different radioactive metal ions that have really interesting properties for nuclear medicine applications. Some emit positrons, so we can do PET imaging. Some emit gammas, so we can do SPECT imaging. Some emit beta minus particles, so we can do therapy with them. So one isotope that does all the things is copper 64. It has a half-life of 12.7 hours. So you can see the different decay pathways here on the bottom left. What we predominantly use copper 64 for is positron emission tomography. The therapy effect is, is fairly minor. The energy of the beta that's emitted is not very strong, the beta minus. The positron is fairly low energy, so that's nice. That gives us nice high resolution images. So the challenge with the copper 64 uh, targetry synthesis is that you need to find, again, an enriched sample. So there are a number of ways that you can make copper 64. Again, you have the little nuclide chart here on the, on the top left, the cutout with the copper 64 in the center. So here are a couple different types of reaction pathways. Probably the most popular one still remains this one here, where we irradiate nickel 64 and in a PN reaction, generate the copper 64. The reason why this reaction is especially popular is because it's very low energy. So biomedical cyclotrons these days um, can go up to, uh, I believe, 18 or 19 MeV fairly easily. But an 11 MeV energy, optimal energy for this reaction, makes this very accessible. So even though that, um, the reaction itself is very accessible. The sort of minor challenge is the target having to be isotopically enriched. As you can see, there are more than one nickel isotopes. There are more than two nickel isotopes. Um, there are actually a number of them. So actually getting an isotopically pure nickel 64 sample is a fairly uh, painful and costly endeavor. So what I'm going to show you in a bit is that people actually have to recycle these targets when they use them. So first, let's talk about this PN reaction and the logistics of it. This is, uh, these are photographs provided to me by my uh, super awesome colleague, Jonathan Engel at 
University of Wisconsin. This is some of the um, targetry that they do on one of their older cyclotrons. You can see the coin target on the left hand side um, over here and the coin target is mounted where it's sitting ready for irradiation. Subsequently, after the irradiation, the purification is carried out. The challenge now is going to be to separate nickel two from copper two. Those are the two elements that we're trying to separate. So the nickel is the target material. The copper is the isotope that we're interested in. Both come in a two plus oxidation state, but now that we are in the transition metal region, we can take advantage of the very different coordination chemistry of these two different elements. So here is an example for a separation that's done using ion exchange for copper and nickel. So I told you about copper 64. There's actually also a shorter lived pet isotope, copper 61, that you see here. It has a 3.4 hour half life. Again, you can use uh, copper, six, um, copper 61, sorry. Um, nickel 60 or nickel 64 as a target here. Do either a deuteron neutron reaction or a deuteron proton reaction um, that concurrently will produce a mixture of these two uh, isotopes. And then additionally, of course, you also have still the target nickel present. So the first thing you do is you dissolve the target, this little coin target that I showed you in a high concentration of hydrochloric acid. So now we have a little beaker with a bunch of nickel and copper swimming in a soup. So what we need to do is use the different chemical properties of nickel and copper to actually separate the two elements. So what is, got, what is done in this case is we can use an anion exchange resin and that you can see here the polymer. This is again a polymer fixed uh, quaternary nitrogen that binds different anions with different affinities. So anything that's anionic is going to bind to this. So the anion exchange resin um, is immobilized here in this column. And what we're loading when we have this really, really acidic solution. So we start with six normal, this is then diluted, sorry, 12 normal to dilute it to six normal. The species that's present chemically is nickel chloride and copper chloride. Now the nickel chloride has a neutral charge, so no charge, whereas the copper chloride, this is tetrahedral structure, is going to have a doubly negative charge. That means that this species here will bind much, much stronger to our anion exchange resin, so it's going to interact with this positive charge here, whereas the neutral nickel chloride is just going to very easily move through the separation column, and we can see this, this is the elution profile, so this is activity here. ACT, activity that we can detect, and then the number of fractions. So as we elute with the high concentration of acid, protons, and then the chloride as well, we maintain the copper chloride stuck to the resin, whereas the nickel chloride comes comes off the resin very easily because it doesn't have actually a charge. So once we finish diluting the nickel chloride, now we can change the speciation of the copper to something that now drops in binding affinity to this, this anion exchange resin. So we want something that doesn't have such a high negative charge. So we achieve that by diluting the acid and the chloride concentration. So then the copper, will change speciation and will turn into this octahedral complex here that has four waters bound and two chlorides bound. The overall charge of this complex here is now neutral. So that allows us to essentially dislodge our copper, our radioactive copper that we're actually interested in from our anion exchange resin and elute it in a fairly small volume and isolate it. So this is ion exchange chromatography for fun and definitely profit to separate target material and isotope that is not of interest from isotope of interest. Any questions to this?
Yeah, on the last slide, there was a picture of the disc. Mm -hmm. Was the like yellowish metal nickel and then the whole center copper or? No, what? the center is the nickel. So this is the target that I circled for you. And then you actually have a plate around and we're going to see that with the yttrium target on um, for the zirconium targetry. You need to have basically something that's um, where you solder on the this target itself that's um, not going to be reactive essentially with the beam. So so the 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 yellowish stuff is just the unreactive thing that's soldered to the actual target? Correct. Got it. More questions? Okay, if there are no more questions to copper, um, separation itself, I'll show you, this is what has to be done to regenerate the target. So after separation and after the sample is cooled, so decayed out essentially, so all the radioactive species have decayed out, the sample has to be regenerated, especially for uh, the nickel 64 sample, where we have an isotopically enriched target material. So the nickel is then transformed um, under different pH conditions to a starting material that can very easily be electroplated. So basically electrochemically, we turn the nickel two back into nickel zero so that we get this coin target back. So this allows more than 60 production cycles with a fairly small nickel 64 target. So this is just an avid challenge that actually very often with targetry um, of radio metals becomes very important because even though we can generate a lot of different types of isotopes of interest, in many cases we need enriched targets. So in order for a radioactive, um, a, a radio metal to become attractive for actual clinical applications, the cost aspect of the target actually unfortunately also plays a role. So if a target is a very low abundance isotope um, that is very costly to purchase and it's difficult to recycle, the chances of that isotope, no matter how good the properties are for biological applications, the chances of that isotope to be translated clinically become lower, which is kind of a frustrating part of, uh, of being in this field that even though you can make a compound that has excellent properties for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes, it might not be able to actually take this leap um, because of the costs associated with it. So here is one that seems to be making the leap fairly easily. Zirconium-89, we already talked a little bit about Zirconium-89. Uh, it's getting pretty popular. There are a number of imaging probes that are based on zirconium-89 um, that are in phase three clinical trials. The reason why people like zirconium-89 is, first of all, emission properties are really nice. Um, it's a long, provides a long half-life, which is a nice complement to very short half-life of fluorine-18. So if you have something that you'd like to image where you would like to image to longer time points, you can use zirconium-89. Other advantages of zirconium-89 among um, different biomedical applications and the ease of radiochemical labeling is the targetry. So here, now again, you can see part of the nuclide chart. You can see that there is only one yttrium isotope that uh, is present. So you can actually use a natural yttrium target to carry out the PN reaction to make zirconium-89, which really cuts down a lot on the cost, which is really advantageous. What you also see here on the right is uh, the cross-section of this nuclear reaction, just basically to show you that it's fairly low energy. Again, you heard me mention biomedical cyclotrons and their energy ranges. So we can also not just use a natural yttrium target, but we can also do the targetry on a biomedical cyclotron, like the one that 
we're trying to still install at Stony Brook. Soon we're going to have it. I feel like I've said this now at every nuclear summer school. Um, we're about to get the cyclotron up and running, but for instance, our own cyclotron could also make zirconium-89 without any issues if we get a solid target option. So this is the PN reaction. We don't need an enriched target. Again, what we need is clever separation chemistry. So here again is your um, setup. So here now you can see again, here's the target. So this is a good side on view. Um, the atrium target is this top target here that's sitting up and is welded onto the tantalum. That's the backing here. So our nuclear reaction occurs here where it's being irradiated with the incident beam. What you see here on the left is before irradiation, after irradiation, and then you can also visualize it where the, the produced zirconium-89 is localized on this plate. Um, this is what it looks like. This is how it's mounted uh, on the, the target surface um, with respect to the incident beam. When it comes to separation, what has been developed here is a resin that is very, very selective for the tetravalent zirconium over the trivalent yttrium. So that's, again, ion exchange chromatography for you. That is, again, very uh, elegant in this case. So you, again, have just a resin that you can immobilize on a column surface. And in this column, onto this column, you can load your mixture of target material that's now the dissolved yttrium in acid and the zirconium in acid. Because of the differences in charge and binding affinity to this hydroxylamine binding moiety, that zirconium likes a lot, but yttrium doesn't like a whole lot. It's really easy to separate the yttrium from the zirconium. This is what it looks like in a semi-automated fashion at Wisconsin. What is done is you load your uh, sample, that's the mixture of your target and your radioactive isotope of interest that's dissolved in an HCl solution. And you load this onto your resin. The zirconium immediately sticks to those hydroxyl amines because it has such a high affinity to those functional groups that it will just bind, whereas the yttrium won't care a whole lot. As you wash with water, the yttrium will form a aqua ion that will very easily wash off this column, while the zirconium re remains bound very strongly to this hydroxamate resin. Now, in order to actually dislodge the zirconium from the resin, we need to introduce something that the zirconium has preferential binding to, and that is going to be a bidentate ligand called oxalate. So oxalate is introduced in excess, so as a one molar solution. And the oxalate will bind to the zirconium and it will exchange with the resin material. And what we can elute now in a very small volume is the actual zirconium oxalate that we can then subsequently use in chemical reactions to introduce onto um, proteins or small molecules to generate our imaging agents. Any questions to this? No question. Zoom fatigue is setting in, probably a little bit. So let me just show you two last examples. More ion exchange chromatography, but now in the context of generators. So I'll show you two examples of generators where we're using ion exchange chromatography not just as a way of separating isotopes or elements from one another, but we're actually using it as a way of storing a parent isotope and then eluding the daughter and using the daughter for subsequent production of radiopharmaceuticals. So one generator that's recently emerged, and this is over the course of the last five years, when the generator is now becoming FDA approved, and the first tracers are now FDA approved with gallium-68. It's a PET isotope that has a fairly short half-life, 68 minutes. Um, uh, the reason for why it's so attractive is because, as I have pointed out, we can have 
a generator that is portable. So we can have a portable source of this very short-lived isotope at a radio pharmacy at essentially any hospital that actually does uh, nuclear medicine studies. So for that, we need the parent isotope that is germanium-68 that's being generated in a P2N reaction from uh, stable gallium-69. The germanium, under really acidic conditions, generates this tetrachloride species that can be immobilized on a titanium or tin oxide ion exchange column. The binding affinity here is quite high. As soon as, however, the germanium decays to the gallium, which it does with a fairly long half-life of 270, almost 271 days, we get a change in the total charge. So germanium is four plus, the gallium is three plus. So uh, even though this is a tetrachloride species, we get a mononegative charge under the elution conditions in the HCl um, that can be anywhere between 1 to 0.1 molar HCl. So we have a high concentration of chloride ions. So under these conditions, now we have a charge difference, and that allows us to very selectively elute the gallium species and separate it from the germanium species that remains stuck on this generator surface. So we can do this numerous times a day, and we can essentially continue to elute for about six months and produce sufficient activity to generate patient doses from uh, these uh, gener portable generators. Just as a fun fact, when I was a graduate student, this is what the generator looks like, looked like. So, you know, I'm dating myself here. This is what it looks like now. So technology has come pretty far. At that time, people were talking about the potential of the generator, the gallium, germanium gallium generator, but uh, translation was really far. So it's really cool to see that over the course of um, the last 12 years, we have come as far as this uh, generator becoming actually something that people can use for nuclear medicine applications in humans. Probably a slightly more famous but also older example is the moly cow. This is one of many of uh, BNL's claims to fame is to develop the technetium generator. So molybdenum 99, which can be produced as a fission product from uranium 235, is actually a great parent isotope to technetium, technetium 99M specifically. Technetium 99M, which is the excited nuclear state, decays to technetium 99. The emission um, in this decay process comes with the emission of this gamma that you can see here. And this gamma can be used to detect, to be detected on a single photon computed tomograph. So you can do SPECT imaging with technetium 99M. So that's really been before the excitement over PET and essentially fluorine 18 um, taking over with all the hype and excitement, technetium 99M was really everybody's favorite radioactive isotope for nuclear medicine applications. Again, that is because people could actually make the molybdenum 99 and then mobilize it on an acidic allox column um, as molybdenum, this, this molybdate species that's doubly negatively charged. As it decays to the technetium or pertechnetate species, um, the charge goes down to mononegative, which allows us to actually elute selectively the pertechnetate with a 0.9% saline solution. So this 0.9% saline solution is extra convenient because now you have your technetium uh, source in a already biocompatible solution that is really easy to do chemistry with. If you look up, and I, I love this because, I mean, obviously there's molybdenum on here, so there's lots of uh, radiation and there's no PPE on this hand. But if you look up the generator, this is, I think, one of the pictures that you get if you do an image search. That is also on the BNL website. So this is the original generator, and this is what the contemporary generator now looks like. Apparently it has won a bunch of design awards. Don't ask me why. To me it just looks like a bucket with a handle. But regardless, still in use, probably for daily scans, uh, potentially even during 
to COVID era. So this is another example for you for ion exchange chromatography, separating isotopes in a very efficient and clever way in order for them to be rendered useful for nuclear medicine. So I apologize for going over the allotted time. This is all I had for you guys today. I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys have them now. Shoot away. You want me to talk through it again? Um, or just show it? Showing is fine? Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Okay. I liked how you did the purple there too to show that it was a third isotope still. <laughs> <laughs>